Amen. You may be seated. This morning I'm going to be reading to you from the 119th Psalm, verse number 11. Psalm 119 has to be one of the longer psalms in the Bible. Psalm 119, verse 11 says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. This is the word of God, and may he richly bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. And we pray, Father, that you would bless this word spoken by me to your people. Father, I pray your spirit rest upon the ears and the hearts of those listening, that they might receive a truth, that they might take home and forever change their lives with. And Father, I pray that as I speak, Father, speak through me in a very powerful way. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of this morning's message is Conquer with God's Word. And I want to play a little trivia game with you. I want to ask you, what is the most powerful book ever written? Hold your answer. Authored by God. God the author. It's been around for ages and ages. It's sold in every bookstore. It's found in every library. Probably on the shelf of every home. It's an awesome, powerful, miraculous, life-changing book. Can you tell me what it is? The Bible, that's right. That's what it is. In fact, Luke 21, 33 says this about the Word of God. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not ever, ever pass away. It's amazing to think about. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Now, are there are a lot of words that are used to describe this book. In the Bible, and I want to share some of these words with you this morning. In James chapter 1, it's described as a mirror. Did you ever think of the Word of God being like a mirror? So that when you open this book up, perhaps, just perhaps, you might see a reflection of yourself in it. It's also referred to in 1 Peter chapter 1 as a seed. That when you read it, a seed is planted, it grows, it blooms, and bears much fruit. Matthew 4.4 4 describes it as food. For man cannot live by what alone? Bread, but every word that comes out of God's mouth. Psalm 119, 105 describes it as both a light and a lamp because it does what? It lights our path in this dark world we live. Jeremiah 23 suggests that the Bible is both like a hammer and like a fire. Now go back a few years. What would you use a hammer and a fire for? Molding, shaping, bending, sculpturing perhaps. I think of a blacksmith trying to straighten metal, something like that. Fires used for refining, purifying. You ever thought that perhaps the Word of God might have that influence or that effect on you? Absolutely it can. Of all the words used to describe this book, I think for me, my most uh, favorite description is that it is like a sword. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, 12, it says, For the word of God is living and powerful, living and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. Ephesians six seventeen says, The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. I love that. The sword of the Spirit. Did you ever think of the Bible as being like a sword? Well, I put out a little request on email and I asked somebody if they had a sword. Mr. Clay Williams had one. And uh, he brought it to church this morning. I told him it might be good to use on some folks or some children, you know, if we, if we need to use it. But he gave me a, a brief history about this sword. This sword was used in the Confederate War, the Civil War. And he pulled it out and he showed me this sword that it has a little damage here that it sustained in battle and it was actually reconstructed. Now I want you to take a look at this sword real good and uh, tell me what, what are swords used for? To kill. to kill. That's mainly the thing, right? But now if you look back far enough you'll find that the use of a sword is to cut or to pierce. Did you know the earliest date found anywhere recorded by humankind that what we had any kind of use for a sword was 1600 B.C.? 
These things had been around for a long, long time. And to think that about 150 years ago, a Calvary Confederate soldier used this to, to bring peace or, or an end to the war, it, it's really amazing that we even have one up here. But these things have been used throughout the course of history, folks, in battle, to, to fend off foes, but also to conquer. And I want you to remember that word this morning, conquer. Because when you think of yet another sword, and I'm going to leave this out here on display. I think it's awesome. You shouldn't bring weapons around, you know, church, but hey, we're, we're using this one. I'm going to put it right here, just as a continuous reminder of, of what the Word of God is supposed to be. But it is the sword of the Spirit. And even the Apostle Paul in this later text here in Ephesians 6.17 says to use this to fend off evil, to fend off the devil. So you might be wondering, well, Brother Hank, how can I conquer with God's word? How can I pick up the sword and conquer with God's word? Well, I want to share that with you this morning. The first thing we can do is we can discover God's word. Psalm 119.12 says, Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. And if the psalmist asked God to help him discover God's word, don't you think it would be good for us to do as well? Discovering God's word promises that we will find those areas that will apply to us and, and, and apply to our lives, meaning that the Bible can really address some critical issues in our lives. And we discover God's word when we trust him to reveal it to us. Now, I like the word discover here because for a lot of people, they don't even know what the Bible is or they've never opened the Bible. And I would suggest to you, if it's been a while since you've opened your Bible, maybe a better word than discover would be to rediscover God's word. Rediscover it. Rediscover what God had to say for you in the world and about life itself. And you might say, well, Brother Hank, what will I discover when I open the Bible? What sort of things can you find? Well, for me, and I like history, the Bible's a book of history. It talks about creation, folks. You can go to college and you go to school and you can hear all these different ideas about creation. But right here in the very first book of the Bible, God tells you how all the world and the universe came about in black and white. It's right there. God tells us. And then you could talk about different battles, and you could talk about the great civilizations, the Roman Empire, the Medes, the Persians. And did you know, even though his name is, isn't mentioned, Alexander the Great is alluded to in the Bible. There's a lot of history here. Now, there's also a lot of romance for you ladies. I don't know if you have ever opened the book of Solomon or not, but listen to these words, ladies, and tell me if these aren't words that you would like to hear in some book Chapter uh, 1 of verse 2 of the Song of Solomon. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Now, is that romantic? Now, who needs to watch The Vow? Or who needs to watch some romantic movie? It's right here in the book of Solomon. Listen to this, guys, if you're needing a line to use on your wife on Valentine's Day. Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. Don't tell your wife she's fair. You might want to tell her she's a lot pretty, but back then these were good words. You are love, you are fair, my love, you are fair. You have dove's eyes. That's romantic, isn't it? Did you know that even though you can even read romance in this great book, the Bible, God is a romantic God. In fact, he's been romantic, he, what's the right word? He's been romanticizing you in hopes that you will come into the kingdom of God and accept a relationship with him. He uses all sorts of ploys on you to draw you into the kingdom of God. And one of the other things that you might discover is God himself. Imagine discovering the most awesome power in the universe. And even greater, if there can be greater than that, you might discover eternal life. Which, folks, you will read about in this great word. So one of the things that we can do to conquer with God's word is simply to discover or rediscover. Another thing that we can do is digest it. Psalm 119.18 says, Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. And Webster defines digest as being to think over and to absorb. We need to delve into God's promises, studying and pondering those words that he has written for us. We should absorb that word of God. The Bible says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. 
We used the illustration just a moment ago with this sponge. And you know, that's very true. You and I ought to soak up God's word as we talked about just a moment ago so that when our lives are so full and, and something bad happens and we seem to be squeezed by life, bad stuff won't come out, but good stuff will come out as a result of our having discovered and digested God's word. Max Lucado refers to studying God's word as mining God's word. For those of you in West Virginia who may know something about coal mining, he refers to it in that fashion. Two of our greatest presidents said some pretty important statements about the Bible. George Washington said this, It is impossible to righteously govern the world without God and the Bible. Oh my gosh. If we had some leaders today that could get behind that thought, eh? President Ronald Reagan said, Within the covers of one single book, the Bible are all the answers to all the problems that we face today, if only we would read and believe. Billy Graham was recently asked, If you could live your whole life over again, what would you do differently? He said this, I would study the Bible more and preach less. Digesting the Word of God, soaking up His Word, making it a part of who we are and then letting it absorb us. The third thing is we can delight in God's word. Once Psalm 119.47 says, For I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. And you know what? Some people just don't delight in reading God's word. It's more of a duty to be performed. But verse 111, Psalm 119 says, They are the rejoicing of my heart. And Christians who delight in God's word, love his word, obey his word, and are victorious through his word. Now, some things are impossible. I believe that there are some things that you and I, if we tried to do by ourselves, would be impossible to do. But guess what? All things are possible through Christ who gives us strength. Amen? Amen. 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 And let's just be honest. We might not find it exciting to open the Bible and start reading it. We might not even have a love for this. But what if we pray this prayer? God, make me thirsty for your word. God, make me hungry for your word. God, give me a love for your word. I find it almost impossible to be a Christian and not have some form of love for this book. Some form of love for God's word. How can we be Christians and go about our daily lives? And how can we tell other people about somebody we don't even know? Having a love of God's word is important in the lives that we lead, is it not? It is. You know what happens if we don't read this Bible? We, we grow up with an ignorance of God's word. We don't know what it says. And so we go about our lives trying to make decisions for ourselves when, as Ronald Reagan himself said, all the answers are right here in God's Word. You know, there was a little boy who was learning about the Bible and he uh, talked to his grandmother about uh, the Bible and he says, which virgin was mother of Jesus, the Virgin Mary or the King James Virgin? You know, he was, he was trying to put it together, this thing. And there was another guy who was walking from Sunday school class to Sunday school. And he, he asked the question to a group of, of uh, fifth grade, sixth grade boys. He says, who knocked down the walls of Jericho? And two boys answered, preacher, we don't know who, but we sure didn't do it. <laughs> Surprised by their lack of Bible knowledge, he turned to the teacher and asked, what do you think of that answer? The teacher replied, well, I've known them since they were little, and if they've always been honest, if they say they didn't do it, I believe them. Dismayed, he went out in the hallway and saw the chairman of the church board. He told him, I was just in the sixth grade boys class and asked, who knocked down the walls of Jericho? Two boys held up their hands and said, we didn't do it, preacher. And the teacher told me that if they said they didn't do it, he believed them. The chairman of the board interrupted him and said, preacher, preacher, let's not fuss about who did what. We'll just fix the walls and pay for it out of the general fund. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So there's a lot of knowledge that actually comes with reading and spending time in the Word of God. How can we be Christians and not have a knowledge of God's Word and what He says? And lastly, this, folks, we should learn to depend on God's Word. Psalm 119.89 says, Forever, O Lord, Your Word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Firmly fixed. 
1 Kings 8, 56 says, There hath not failed one word of all of his good promises. Few things in this life are trustworthy. People let you down. Money lets you down. Politicians let you down. People let each other down. Even things in this life let us down and fail. Fail, that's who we are. We're human beings. The Word of God will never let you down. Now my last question is, who watches Seinfeld in this church this morning? Anybody watch Seinfeld? Sometimes you get tired of watching it. You might know them all by heart whatnot. There's a guy there in part of that group called Kramer. And I always thought that if it weren't for Kramer, they wouldn't have a sitcom. He kind of gives the whole show a lot of humor and, and funniness. You know how Kramer opens the door and enters the room? He just kind of stands there and his hair is all standing up and he has this way of speaking. But have you ever wondered that, that he just kind of comes in uninvited? And what does he do when he gets in, in Jerry's room? He, he turns on the TV, he sits down in the chair, he, he goes back to the refrigerator and helps himself. He even has his own set of keys to Jerry's apartment. He takes what he wants and uses it for himself, and he just makes himself at home in Jerry's apartment. Folks, that's how we should be with the Word of God. We should make ourselves at home, <coughs> helping ourselves. To God's word. And if we do that, folks, we will be conquerors. We will have conquered life when our days come to an end. This morning, I want to ask you another question. What kind of swordsman are you? Do you know how to use this thing? Are you using it now? Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we love that that you have given us your word. You tell us that heaven and earth are going to pass away. And even though our mind can't wrap around that thought, or even have a slightest idea as to how heaven and earth could pass away, you do give us the promise that your word will never pass away. And sometimes in our own lives, we feel like heaven and earth and our personal lives may be passing away. But Father, we can depend on your word to help us conquer, to help us fight, to help us stand at the end of the day. Bless us with that encouraging word. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.